We are all in on 2022. Acquia employees across all departments, regions, and teams are doubling down. We are all in on EMEA, APJ, marketing, MOPS, sales, Drupal Cloud, CGP, DXP, and betting on ourselves with ambitious goals to make this year our year. I'm all in on customization, collaboration, and personalization. I'm going to need a vacation. Everyone is ready to roll. So watch out, 2022. Boston is all in. Reading is all in. Pune is all in. Madison is all in. Tokyo. Munich. Toronto. Sydney. Paris and Brighton are all in. All in. All in. All in. Je fais tapis. We're putting it all on blue because Acquia is all in. Um, welcome. Last day of DrupalCon. My name is Ron Northcutt. I'm the director of developer advocacy at Acquia, as you saw there. And I'm really excited to be here. I've been having such a great time seeing my friends learning new things, sharing information, and it's really cool to be uh, together again in person and celebrate the community that we care so much about. Now hopefully you have all been having a good time at the sessions, activities, the events, um, probably a few people out late last night maybe? I think so, yeah. Um, but fun's not over, we still have one last full day, We've got some great sessions, and Drupal Trivia Night is tonight. Now if you missed it yesterday, we do have a mini trivia session uh, against Drees in the Acquia booth about 2 p.m. Yesterday, Anna won, and you get to take a picture of the scoreboard and brag about how you beat Drees at Drupal Trivia, so I highly recommend you check it out. It'll be a good warm-up for tonight. Um, but unfortunately, not everybody could be here uh, today to take part in DrupalCon, and as Drees talked about yesterday, you know, we're thinking about our friends and our community in Ukraine. So if you haven't done so yet, I would highly recommend that you run by the Acquia booth and get a scan. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna allow us to donate to um, the IRC, the International Rescue Commission, in your name to help refugees um, that are fleeing the situation in Ukraine. So definitely check that out. You might also consider going to rescue.org, that's their site, happens to be on Drupal, by the way. Um, making a direct donation, you can also do cool things like gifts and gift donations to people. Um, so a really great way to go. But that's one of the things that makes the Drupal community so great. Um, we're so special and inclusive and we have people from all over the world, from all different backgrounds, with all different skill sets, but we're still one single community. And even though we do really, really well at being inclusive, there's still a long way to go. Not just in Drupal, but in open source and in technology as a whole. And diversity makes us stronger. It makes us more resilient, and when we have more equity, we can support and foster that community that, that does make us stronger overall. So I would like to introduce to you this fireside chat about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and I, one thing to note is there's gonna be a QR code. When it pops up, check in, because you're gonna be able to use that to ask your questions, which will then be moderated as part of this. But um, enough of me, I would like to introduce Demetrius Cheatham the Director of Diversity and Inclusion Strategy at GitHub. So, thanks everybody. Hello everyone. I had all of these prepared remarks and then they had a video up there talking about they're all in, and that's actually what I'm here to talk to you about, all in. See, like we didn't plan that, I didn't pay them or anything, so good job, Ron, on that one. But I am here today to talk about two of my favorite things, diversity and inclusion and open source. And I promise you, I'm not just saying that because that's literally my job. Speaking of my job, I'm the Senior Director for Diversity and Inclusion Strategy at GitHub. And I remember when I was interviewing for my job at GitHub and I was speaking to the then COO, Erica Brescia, and she was telling me all about how GitHub takes this very holistic approach to diversity and inclusion. It's embedded across their entire business strategy. It's people, it's platform, philanthropy, 
and policy. And so after she told me this, she asked me that question. So Demetrius, tell me why you want to join GitHub. Now, all of us know that that question is coming, but she had just finished telling me about all of this amazing work and this amazing platform that GitHub had. When I was interviewing, it was 50 million developers on the platform, and now it's 73 million developers. And so in that moment when she asked that question, it came to me. I want to join GitHub because I want to open source diversity and inclusion. And I have to humbly say it was a great answer because I'm here. I got the job, right? <laughs> so what does open source and diversity and inclusion mean? Well, to find that out, I just started talking to as many people as I possibly could across um, the open source ecosystem. Some of you who are in this room today. And there were a couple of things that came up. One, inclusion happens at the community level. And what do I mean by that? When someone first comes into open source, that first one or two interactions that they have within a community, it really sets the stage on whether they're going to stay or whether they're going to leave. If it's a positive interaction, they say, open source, it's the best. These are my people, and they're here for good. But if they have some negative interactions, they come in and say, uh-uh, these are not the people that I want to be with, to be spending my free time with, and they leave, and oftentimes they never come back. The second thing was that maintainers or that community leader, they really set the tone for an inclusive culture within their community. And so then I started talking to maintainers, and I said, well, do you have what you need? And they were like, Demetrius, we have all the resources that we need. We have podcasts, checklists, trainings, there's conferences, there's articles, you name it. All of them is sitting in our dusty virtual folder. So resources, we don't need any more of those. So I said, well, if you have the resources, what's the problem? What's going on? What do you need? And so this is where the, you know, the conversation started to differentiate a bit. So when I talked to maintainers of smaller communities, they said, yes, we have resources and we're able to touch most of our contributors on a day-to-day -day basis, but we just don't have the bandwidth or the time. You see, there's this competing interest. When you are the maintainer of a smaller community, you're trying to get as many people to contribute to your community as you can. You're trying to get people from wherever they are, whoever they are, you just simply need hands on the keyboard. But when I started talking to maintainers of larger communities, and let me put a caveat in there, it's actually maintainers of well-sourced communities as well, because you can have a small number of, of contributors, but if you are well-resourced, then this is usually where you fall in the same as well. And so what they said was, we have the time, we have the bandwidth, we have the resources, including money, but we've lost the influence. What that means is that there's a definite tipping point when your community becomes so large that you can't easily influence the culture anymore. So then you have this natural tension. The time that you needed to focus on being, becoming a more inclusive community is a time when you actually don't have the time or the bandwidth to do it. So what do you do in that moment? But one thing, whoever we talked to, they said regardless of whether we are small, large, well-resourced, under-resourced, there are still significant barriers to access to open source, especially for people from underrepresented backgrounds and marginalized communities. So what was happening is we were working on creating these inclusive communities, but if that gate is still so high that people can't get to these welcoming communities, what are we really doing? So we can't fall into the myth that if we build it, they will come. We have to do a little bit more work there. And that's why at Acquia, y'all te teed it up for me, we have created an open source community called All In. And All In is, is mission is to increase and advance diversity, equity, and inclusion in open source through access, community, equity, and data. And let me make sure that I was clear. It is a community, and a community is made up of people, including all of you. 
So for the rest of this talk, I want you to listen to me and hear about how you can contribute to All In because this is an invitation for all of us. So since we launched All In last year, we launched with three goals in mind. One, we needed some data. We needed to understand where we are from a diversity, equity, and inclusion perspective so that we can understand how we're doing year over year as well as to hold ourselves accountable. The second thing we wanted to do was to launch and complete a maintainer's listening tour, which we successfully did. And finally, we kicked off an all-in pilot specifically for students and one that's coming up for maintainers. So first, the open source diversity, equity, and inclusion survey. We partnered with the Linux Foundation because we wanted to survey all of open source, not just the GitHub platform. And so I can tell you, we released a final report last December. It is 64 pages of delicious data for any of you data wonks that really want to know what, how we're doing. And we didn't just stop with giving data and insights. There are specific calls to action. So for many of you that always call me and say, Demetrius, we want to help. What can we do? Your first stop should be that report. And there's a list of action items or gaps in which we need for people to really be thinking about. So I just want to share with you one of the really surprising statistics from that survey. 82% of survey respondents said that they feel welcome in open source. They agreed strongly with this statement. Now I can tell you, any company that gets an 82% favorability rating on their engagement surveys, I'm telling you, they are popping bottles and champagne and confettis coming down. That is a really good number. So a lot of people would have stopped there and said, we don't have any issues in open source. We're good to go. Let's move on. That is not the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We give voice to those that are not included in that 18%. We want to hear what is going on with that 18% or the one or almost five and almost five that do not agree with that statement. What are their stories? What are their experiences? What are the behaviors that they are encountering? Because it's those stories, experiences, and behaviors that's probably keeping millions of others from even attempting to join open source. What are the thoughts and feelings of the 25% of persons with disability who do not agree with that statement that they feel welcome in open source? What about the 26% of women? or the 29% of persons of color here in North America, and the staggering 38% of non-binary or third gender contributors who said that they do not feel welcome in open source. That is the work. That's where we need to lean into. We celebrate the 82%, but we have to make sure that we're giving the voices to those, those people that do not feel welcome in open source. And so when we started digging into that number, there were some things that came out, some specific things. The first was if they didn't have the technical skills and knowledge to contribute to, um, to the community, they were made to feel inferior. You're not welcome here. If you're not contributing to code, then you should just go over there or maybe find another community. That was something that we heard a lot of. Another thing was just a lack of response and rejections to contributions. If you ignore your contributors, they feel invisible. They're not over there thinking that you're rude or that you're, you're busy. No, they're actually saying, I just don't even exist here in open source. 80% of, of the survey respondents said that this happens occasionally. 40% said that it happens regularly. So make sure you are setting up processes or at least in your documentation, setting up expectations so people know that if you don't respond within a certain window, this is what's happening, but you still value their contributions. Another is that, that we heard was that their voice isn't heard or their contributions aren't valued. There was a very specific quote in the comments that said that, if I am not white, if I am not male, if I am not well-educated, if I am not wealthy, no one cares about me at open source. And we know that is not true. 
So you have to make sure that you are setting up your community hospitality and your, your documentation so that when people come into your community, they know that no matter whoever they are, wherever they are, no matter their education, their experience level, all of those things, that they are valued and there's a place for them not only in your community but within open source. And another thing was around microaggressions and stereotypes especially in written and spoken language. There was also a lot of cultural barriers. There was 50% of Portuguese speakers said that they did not feel welcome in open source. And I know a lot of you are thinking, oh, this might be an international when we're talking about cultural barriers. Only 36% of survey respondents were from North America, and out of that 36%, 53% said that they do not feel welcome in open source. So this is something that's happening here in North America as well as internationally. So mind your language, think about those things, those unconscious biases, your language matters, words matter. So we have to get to the point where inclusion is the norm and not the exception. We all have to set up things like I mentioned, community hospitality and triage process. A good example of this is the open, so, open, open source community, where anytime you log on into that community, you join that community, you instantly receive an email that says, or a notification, welcome to our community. Here's how you can join. Here's how you can contribute based on your experience level. Your contributions are valued. Your voice is heard. This is how long it's going to take us to respond to you. That makes a difference, and I also have to do a shameless plug that that's automatically set up through GitHub Actions, so you can do that automatically. <laughs> also, we have to do things like Sean Goggins in the chaos community. He's been working on this, um, and, and you know, it's all the technical stuff, so the auger, where any maintainer can run a real-time report to scan all of the language and conversations that's happening across their community. It checks for voice, it checks for tone, it checks for non-inclusive language. You can get that report instantly. It comes back to you and then you know where you, need to, you might need to go and insert yourself into a conversation. But we also have to make sure that maintainers have de-escalation techniques, training. They have to make sure that they understand how to insert themselves into the conversation without creating more exclusion, without inflaming the situation. So we have to make sure that maintainers are well equipped and trained in that way as well. We also have to make sure that we're doing things consistently like inclusive language scans, accessibility audits and compliance, enforced code of conduct. Just having a code of conduct is the bare minimum now. Now you have to think about how do you enforce code of conduct. All of these things have to be just second nature to every single community and that's when we get to the point where inclusion is not the exception, it is the norm. The second thing after the survey, we launched and completed a maintainers listening tour. We wanted to make sure that whatever we were doing for maintainers, we were creating it with maintainers and not for maintainers. So we launched a series of individual interviews, in-person and virtual focus groups, and there was an online asynchronous forms where we could hear from maintainers on what are some of the challenges you are facing? What's working? What's not working? What would you need in a program that's dedicated for you so that you can have what you need to create more inclusive communities? We heard them loud and clear. They didn't want just more resources. They wanted direct technical assistance, and that's some of the things that came out of the maintainers listening tour. If you're interested in learning more about some of the preliminary findings for the maintainers listening tour, you can go to allinopensource.com, click on community, and you'll have a video where I did there on um, some of the preliminary findings as well as a Twitter thread. But the final report will be released in June for the maintainers listening tour. The next thing we did was we created a 12-month pilot. Now, the all-in for maintainers pilot is going to be built based on the findings that we learned from the maintainers listening tour. But we also kicked off something called all-in for students, and we just had the graduation ceremony last week. So let me tell you about all-in for students. 
we wanted to provide access and exposure for students from historically black colleges and universities here in, the, in North America, as well as there's one school that was founded for the education of Native Americans. And what we wanted to do was give them a direct pathway to success, which ultimately this was a summer internship experience, in open source. So the first thing we did during the fall semester back in August through December, they had open source education and professional development. So the Linux Foundation generously provided an online course for the students to take, as well as a professor that was available to them pretty much 24 seven for any type of support that they needed as well. And so they also received career development because we know you can teach people the technical skills, but tech, we are a different type of environment, right? So we wanted them to know all of the things that all of us wish we had known when we first started out in tech. What does it mean and what does it look like and what do you do when you are the only one on a team? What do you do when you are faced with microaggressions, not if you are faced with microaggressions? How do you leverage employee resource groups? How do you make sure that you are getting great feedback that's necessary for your growth and development during performance evaluations? We went over all of these things with them. And that's what they went through during the first half of this program. The second half, which they just completed, was a 12-week fellowship with Major League Hacking, where they got direct programming experience within open source. And so after they got these technical skills, this was preparing them to get ready for a summer internship opportunity with one of our corporate partners. We were very intentional about the schools that we selected. We went to the smaller schools where no corporate partners usually are showing up. We went to the schools that are often overlooked. When you are really serious about expanding the talent pool, you go in places where no one else is going, and that's what we wanted to do with All In. We were also very intentional about the students that participated in All In. Oftentimes, a barrier to entry, especially into summer internships, is your GPA. But GPA is not the only indicator for success. The students in this program, you have some of them that commute two hours each way to school because they can't afford to live on campus. Many of them are caregivers, especially during the pandemic, where they are still at home with parents or grandparents because they have to take care of them. Some of them are full-time parents. Active duty military, because this is the way that they are paying for college. You have some that are um, student athletes, football teams. We have the captain of the swim team. These are students that because they are training and have to keep their scholarship to pay for school, they couldn't do a summer internship. So what do they do when they graduate and there's no experience on their resume? Those were the students that we wanted in this program. Those were the students that life happened. How do you have a 4.0 GPA or 3.0 GPA when you have all of those things? And you can't just stop with giving them the technical, the technical experience. We had to wrap them in support. We had to make sure that they had corporate partners backing them. They had the all-in program backing them, major league hacking. We had their university partners, which were their professors, as well as the chairs of their computer science departments. We were in constant contact with each other, talking to each other constantly. We made a commitment that if you joined All In, we were All In, we had your back, we were not letting anyone go from this program. That's what All In means. All In, this is what it looks like. These were our founding partners, the schools, the, the corporate partners, as well as the organizations that joined us on this journey. And I have to say that most of our students, maybe one or two of them, but most of them had never had a summer internship before. As of graduation last, last week, 80% of them had summer internships. And last night I checked, we're at 90%. We will get to 100% by the time this program is over. 
But I made sure before I came here, I checked with our graphics design partner, and I said, how many more logos can I get up here? <laughs> and they said, there's plenty, so I want to see Drupal up here next year, and I want to see Aquia, because you already said you were all in, and I want to see more of your companies that are up here. But let me be very, very clear. All in is not a program. It is a community. And again, a community is made up of people, is made up of all of you. And if we're really going to move the needle, if we're really going to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion in open source, it's going to take each and every one of us. So here are some ways that you can join. Go to allinopensource.org. We need your thought leadership. We need your volunteerism. We need money. Uh, we need all of those things. We need you to become a corporate partner. I was actually scared. I had more open recs for my corporate partners than students. And so GitHub said, let's scale this baby. So we're going for 10x for this program. So I'm definitely going to need more corporate partners. And we're also going to be looking to how we can connect these students with even having summer opportunities with some of our um, communities as well. So again, this is my invitation to you. We're going to have Q&A next. But I want to leave you all with all of this. I want you to join us and become all in. Let's open source diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you. So I hope you all had some amazing q and I am supposed to um, give a bio and introduce Lauren, but she's just my friend. And so Lauren, come on up here and introduce yourself. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Demetrius. It's nice to see you again. Uh, we last saw each other uh, for context at All Things Open in Raleigh in October. That's where we met. Um, we connected through Karsten Wade at Red Hat, who some of you might know. Uh, my pandemic summer project in summer 2020 was to uh, write a chapter for the Open Source Way guidebook on how to make open source communities more inclusive uh, and therefore to attract more diverse contributors. And so obviously Demetrius' work is really exceptional in this space. I have never heard a DEI keynote or presentation like what you've talked about today. And so I think the work you're doing is so truly exceptional and I'm really excited to talk to you about it. As a reminder, uh, there should, you should have access to a QR code, and what I have here is a list of questions uh, that people are responding to, or rather that people are submitting in real time. Um, so if you have questions for Demetrius that you want asked on stage, feel free to submit them, and I will ask as many as time allows. Uh, and before we get going, I'll quickly give an overview of myself. Uh, my name's Lauren Maffeo. I am a service designer for Steampunk, which is a government contracting firm centered on human-centered design based in Washington, D.C. Uh, I've also been a com community correspondent for opensource.com for the last three years, and I've been contributing to Drupal in various ways uh, for about four years. And I'm working on a Drupal project uh, at right now at work, which is a very big website migration. So uh, I had, w learned a lot from the content here uh, at the conference alongside speaking myself. So you know Demetrius now as a senior director of DEI at GitHub, but your career, Demetrius, is so much more than that. Uh, I would really encourage you all to look up her bio and get a sense of what, sh of what you've done. You have an MBA and a JD. Uh, you've worked in banking it, as a chief of staff in local government. You've worked as the executive director of a nonprofit association. So you have a very successful track record of serving in these very high-level roles. What prompted you to become an open source maintainer now at this stage in your career? Well, um, I always humbly like I'm an open source maintainer now. But um, I think really what prompted me to start all in and start this open source community, um, it's, it's a weird story, but actually when I first moved back to North Carolina um, and my daughter was enrolled in school and I went to my first PTA meeting, Parent Teacher Association, and it was a mom that came up to me. And at the time, I was working at Red Hat. She was like, I heard you were working at Red Hat. I want my daughter to shadow you. She didn't ask. She just told me. I was like, OK, I guess your kid is shadowing me. Fine. And she said, here's her resume. 
and she pulled it out. And the first thing I noticed, it was a two-page resume. And I was like, why does your 10th grader have a two-page resume? But whatever. So I looked at the first top quarter of it, and it was her name, school, you know, she played softball or whatever. And the next three quarters of the page and all of that second page were full of all of her GitHub contributions. And I was like, what the heck? <laughs> like, I, I heard somebody in the audience say it. And what instantly went through my mind was that I know there are students at HBCUs and Hispanic serving institutions that haven't even heard of open source. And yet here are 10th graders, and my daughter goes to a very privileged private school. They could go and probably walk into an entry level job. And I was just always, that, that moment has always stuck in my head. And so when I got to GitHub and they said, hey, we want you to advance open source, um, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion on our platform, that came back to me. And that's when I said I want to do something with All In and to just make sure that we're leveling the playing field, giving mm -hmm. people at least access and exposure to it. Because you don't, if you don't even have access to it, you can't even participate in it. And so it was just lowering that gate that I talked about. I, I agree. Uh, when I was at DrupalCon Seattle in 2019, I was really struck by Dries saying uh, that he really had rethought uh, who is able to contribute to open source because there is still, I think, a train of thought that says if you just, you can just make time to do it, anybody can make time to contribute to open source, and that's not what the data shows. And the reality is for a range of reasons, mm -hmm. uh, th there are very clear gaps in who even has the free time to contribute to Drupal and other open source projects for free. Uh, and it's not hyperbole to say that your open source career and your career in tech really reflect trying to make it more inclusive when even before GitHub at Red Hat, you oversaw DEI for the whole talent life cycle. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, as you got more involved in trying to make open source specifically more inclusive, not just tech, what were some trends that you noticed? I think the first thing that I noticed when I first started talking about um, you know, open source and what was happening, just the duplication of efforts. There were so many resources. There were so many, I mean, companies were all approaching this. And I was like, and I think it's like a $15 billion a year industry, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, I, and But the numbers weren't moving. So it wasn't making sense to me. And I was like, if you have any organization throwing $15 billion a year at something and the numbers aren't moving, everybody would be fired, right? Mm -hmm. So that was the thing that was really throwing me off. And so when I looked at it, everybody was focusing their efforts on when someone has graduated and we're trying to get them that first job. So there were tons of boot camps out there. Every company was starting their you know, internship program. You had everybody saying, we're gonna offer them free certifications. But then when I went into these schools, there are still some students that their school, they, can't, they don't even have the infrastructure on school to log into Wi-Fi. So they can't get on their, on their laptops or their phone at school. So if they have a coding project, and you all know we code at night. I have a very dusty computer science degree, so I used to be a programmer. But we're doing that at night, and I said, well, how are you all programming? They were like, we'll get in the car and drive up to the 24-hour McDonald's, which is in a sketchy neighborhood. Or they were going to one of the predominantly white schools and praying that someone didn't call the cops on them or security. And so I'm like, well, if companies are giving them these internships and these certifications, they don't even have the infrastructure to even take advantage of them. Like some of the students in the all-in program, they said that, you know, once the pandemic hit and summer internships went virtual, that was the worst thing that could have happened to them because they didn't have Wi-Fi at home. So they couldn't even participate in a summer internship. And I was like, we got to look at this more holistically and no one organization can solve for all of this. And this is where I said we have to come together and open source. We know how to do that. The lack of broadband was shocking to me, too. I mean, on a totally different note, in on one of my client projects at work, I am working with a federal agency that works with farmers very closely. And the people that I interviewed in Arkansas, Wyoming, Montana, I mean, they they are a lot of them are using satellite. I mean, mm -hmm. there is a, an enormous swath of the U.S. population that does not have access to the internet and to reliable broadband. And I mean, that is 
if you can't access the internet, you can't access open source. And that's shocking, yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, we do have a question from someone who wanted to know more about if folks in the Drupal community were part of the all-in listening tour for maintainers and part of the survey, uh, and they're specifically interested in insights that the Drupal cohort can, uh, can build upon. Sure. Well, first of all, I have to say, um, and, and I spoke with Vaughn about this earlier, Drupal, y'all are killing it. Um, I got here yesterday, and the first thing that I, I mean, like, give yourselves a hand. Just this conference alone, and I tweeted about it. I was looking in the program book and just, some, you know, the lactation rooms, the quiet rooms, the non-denominational prayer room. Y'all are here. Y'all are here with it, and not just at your conference. Um, this is my first DrupalCon, it's definitely not my last, but when I was telling people that I was coming here, everybody was like, oh, the Drupal people, they're so nice. That's what they call you all. They're like, the Drupal people are so nice. You're gonna have such a great time. And I instantly felt welcome when I walked through these doors yesterday. And so you all are already doing it. When people tell me about where they tell new contributors to go, Drupal is one of the first ones. But I can say there's areas for all of us to take a look at. I, have now, I now have an appreciation for how important documentation is. Documentation, that is the be all, end all of just about everything. So if you wanna look at inclusion, it's not this really high pie in the sky stuff. Look at your documentation first and foremost. When people come to your community, let them know what to expect. Sometimes there are communities you don't want new contributors for whatever reason, like you have your small thing, you're, you're trying to fix it, and then you're moving on. But imagine some really, you know, wide-eyed, you know, bright person comes in, like, I want to contribute, and you're like, we don't need you here. Just that quickness right there is just a miscommunication. But if you put that in your documentation, they know. How do you ascend to leadership? Like, I've heard there's a lot of politics going on in open source, right? And so people who are ascending to leadership are hand-selected. Let your process be known, even if it is a hand-selection process, so that people aren't working themselves out and then feeling like they're slighted. Um, let people know how they can make a valuable contri contribution from day one. I've been hearing horror stories about how people who are trying to be community leaders where some other community leaders are saying, if you don't contribute to code, you can't be a community leader. But they're like, I'm doing all of this amazing work, this work that's so critical, whether it's your QA, your testing, your documentation, and all these things, and you're telling me that that's not as valued? So all of those things are conversations that need to be had. But like I said, you all are well ahead of the game, but there's still more work. I still would like for you all to be kind of the standard bearers that I can point to when people are doing some amazing work. Yeah, you really do live and die by your documentation. I, I think this comes up every open source conference, and I know that it's not the most fun thing to do, but I also vividly remember going on to GitHub for the first time years ago, and if, if I hadn't already been to an open source conference in person and met so many great people, I would have closed the laptop and never gone back, because if you are not familiar with it, it's pretty dicey to mm -hmm. follow around. Uh, one of the results of your listening tour, Demetrius, that I thought was really interesting when we talked privately was you said that many open source contributors of minority status maintain their own communities. That sounds really promising at face value. They have the, if not one of the leadership roles in their communities. Tell us why that's the case and why that's not as rosy as it seems. Yeah, so I'm gonna talk about this, but we're still digging into the research on this a little bit more. So when, you know, you were looking at those statistics around 18% don't feel welcome in open source, you just naturally make those assumptions that those are people who are not in the majority. But when we started, sli you know, slicing it out and looking at maintainers, we found that maintainers from underrepresented background, they had very high scores of feeling welcome in open source. And so I started taking a look at that. I was like, something isn't adding up for me. And what I found was that you had maintainers, and this was backed by the maintainers listening tour, they would go into a large community, did not feel welcome, and then they would go and start their own communities of their own people. So again, we were looking at it and celebrating like, oh no, maintainers you know, of color and women maintainers, like they are welcome in open source, they're great. But what we found was that when they didn't feel welcome, they went and created their own communities. And that just started feeling a lot like separate but equal to me. 
I was like, that's not solving the issues. That's not solving the gaps, especially when you look at a lot of those communities that they started, they are underfunded. They are under-resourced. They are, there's a lot of you know, burnout that's happening there. No one's paying attention to them. So I don't want us to sit here and say, oh no, we don't have an open, like the maintainers who are women, people of color, they're doing great. They're starting their own communities, they're thriving. There's so many opportunities to support that. And so the question that came up earlier, what can Drupal do? One of the findings for the maintainers listening to her, and it happened during a focus group and it was so beautiful. We had one community that said a smaller one ran by a woman that said that they had someone that was helping them remove dead names from their code. They were about 80% finished, but that person got a full-time job and had to walk away from the project, so it was unfinished. And all of a sudden, a maintainer of a larger community said, hey, we did that. We had about you know, 40 people working on that. We'll send some people over there and help you really quickly and get that done and off of your plate. We need to see more of that. So when you have a large community like Drupal, start looking out into open source at those smaller communities that may not even be Drupal related to see ways that you all can help them do some of the things that you already do so well. Yep. I think that's great advice. Uh, we have a in really great question here about soliciting input from diverse groups in open source without alienating or tokenizing that person or the community. This is a really, this is difficult to do uh, and to do it thoughtfully and well. So how did you take that approach when you were going on your maintainers listening tour and collecting data? Yeah, so I think the, well, I wanna answer that in two parts. One, I think that if we plan to be as inclusive as possible, you actually don't need to hear from the voices of those that are marginalized. Like when I was looking into this book and I saw you all had lactation rooms, I was like, I wonder did anybody call them and said, hey, I need a lactation room. Probably not. You're just playing for it. You have American Sign Language interpreters here, whether or not someone identifies as being deaf or not. You have captions, regardless of whether someone says that they are visually impaired. So if you go ahead and plan for that, you don't need to hear from anyone. And I'm always, and especially with engineers, and I kind of say this in a room full of engineers, I think sometimes we rely on the data too much. Like I've seen times where I've said, hey, we have an issue where we don't have enough women in something, right? And then someone will say, well, women at what level? Well, women where? Women on Tuesdays. Well, what about on Saturdays? Are they contributing on Saturdays? Like they keep sending people down this rabbit hole of data and listening tours and all of these things. We know what the issue, I got a 64 page report that can tell you what the issues are. So if you wanna know, just start there and be as inclusive as possible. However, you also have to make sure that your data lines up with the sentiment because Surveys are only a sample, and usually some of those that are most impacted will not respond to a survey. So that sentiment, so don't just totally throw away with them. That's why we did the maintainers listening tour. You have to have those conversations. The first thing you want to do is make sure you're in relationship with people. Tell them why you are talking to them. Tell them how you want to help. Tell them you don't intend to tokenize them. I always ask every interview that I do is say, what haven't I asked you? What else do I need to know? Who else should I be talking to? That really shows your sincerity and that you really care about the issues. And then when you have them, do something. We ship in, in software, we ship. You need to ship diversity, equity, and inclusion. One thing, and Lauren, you and I have talked about this before, no offense to anybody that's ever written this article, but I was like, if I see one more article on ways that we can create more inclusive communities for maintainers, I'm gonna like fall over. We see you taking that same article, renumbering the bu bullets and putting your logo on it. Like and the we, number's not moving. The numbers are not moving. We got enough of those articles. Look at something else and actually do some of those things. I would like to see an article that says, these are the things that I identified. This is what we did about it. Here's the impact. Like that's the next step of it. But I think we've got, we have the data. We have the conversations now. Yeah. Let's get to work. I completely agree, and th the fact that All In is for both maintainers and students is really emphasizing that there are a lot of duplicate efforts in this space, uh, and so the idea really is to open source DEI in the sense of sharing knowledge. From your listening tour, what is both the best shared idea for increasing DEI in an open source community, and consequently, what is a poor practice that you see fairly common 
that you think the, com the communities should avoid? Well, I can answer this quickly. I've talked about the documentation and I've talked about how larger communities can help under-resourced communities. Those are the two kind of best practices that I've seen. What I've seen um, is a bad practice. Nothing is bad, they're, they're attempting. Um, I'll, I'll talk to a community or a maintainer, and this is usually one of the larger ones or the well-resourced, um, and they'll say to me, Demetrius, we've done all of these efforts right here. We are trying to get more people of color, more women into our community, and we just can't. They're just not showing up. And so I'll say, well, tell me how, what your outreach strategy was. How did you reach out to them? They were like, we posted this on Twitter, we sent it out in our community, and we you know, went on LinkedIn and posted it there inviting them. And then I'll say, and I love when I do this in person because it just makes it that much more dramatic. But I'll say, pull up your Twitter feed for me. Let me see who your followers are and who you're following. And I'll say, pull up your LinkedIn and sh tell me who's in your network. Usually the people that are in your personal networks are similarly situated. They usually look like you. They are from the same background. So if you're sending out invitations to people that already look like you are from the same background, you wonder why nobody's showing up? That's why we have to expand our personal networks, who we have lunch with, who we have coffees with. Even when I come to open source company conferences, and this is not what happened here at Drupal, it's like all these little clicks. Everybody comes to see their friends. Invite somebody in that might from, be from a different background. Like, make sure that you are extending yourself so that people that don't look like you have different experiences that are from different places, that they become part of your personal networks. I am also a, a somebody that's guilty of this. If someone wants to, you know, have diverse candidates or people from diverse backgrounds apply for a job, they'll say, Demetrius, can you put this on LinkedIn and send it out to your network? Because usually you're gonna have a diversity of candidates that's gonna come to you. So even I have to expand my networks and talk to people even in uncomfortable conversations. And so I say that that is a practice that I've seen over and over again, that there's a lot of room for improvement. So making sure that you are extending yourself in your personal network, so then when that invitation goes out, it's more reflective of the people you wanna invite into your community. Yep. And to grow uh, that community at both the maintainer and student level, uh, I'll bring it back to everybody's favorite topic in open source, money. Uh, so what does open source software funding look like in the context of All In? We have to solve for open source funding. In the survey, only 14% of people who were not employed full-time, meaning this isn't what they do for their normal job, only 14% of everyone else said that they received any type of funding for open source. And we saw some security breaches over the past few months that says what it looks like when you have people that are not getting paid that's responsible mm -hmm. for something that's critical to all of us. And I know at GitHub, we are working on this. We have something called GitHub Sponsors where you can actually contribute money directly to your maintainers or your projects or even contributors to your, um, your community. We have to solve it. There are some inherent disadvantages. There are some inherent privileges, even from the DEI perspective. I was talking to some maintainers and you know, we we're talking about resources and they were like, it's just unfair. If you are a maintainer that works for a company, you have access to all of the DEI trainings that that company has. We don't mm -hmm. have that. We yeah. just have like these hundreds of different types of trainings and we don't know which one is good. We don't know which one is the best for us. And so it's all over the place and we just don't do anything. So we have to make sure that we address the funding issue. And so as part of All In, we will be launching All In for, I'm gonna figure out the name at some point in time, All In for funding, I don't know. But we will be making sure that through GitHub sponsors that we are focused on those contributors, those maintainers, and those projects that focus on marginalized communities are, are from underrepresented backgrounds. Yep, we have quite a few questions about uh, government partnerships and especially regarding the Wi-Fi issue. Um, I know there's a big initiative at the federal level to expand broadband access across the U.S., but uh, we have a question here about, our, about government partnerships or NGOs 
Uh, who are you partnering with at the moment to bridge that broadband gap? Yeah, so right now we are partnering um, with, and I actually have a meeting with them next week, with Airband, which is an initiative from Microsoft where they do partner with the government to address some of these issues. And so with All In, we do have government stakeholders, we do have nonprofits, we do, you know, the social sector, we have corporate partners, the universities. So you're absolutely right that we do have government partners in there, and we're going through Microsoft at the time. But welcome to any type of relationships or things or people that may know folks. That's what we want. We want more introductions into this. We are also looking at corporate partners who are looking to fund this. Now, one of those schools that I talked about is three blocks from one of our major corporate partners. And they said, hey, we don't do infrastructure. We don't know how to do this. But Cisco and Intel, they know how to do it. And as soon as Cisco and Intel heard about it, they were like, oh, let's partner on this and work on it together. These were conversations that were not happening before, and we want to have more of those where if you are, we want to make sure that companies that are partnering with us, they're staying, you know, true to their mission and solving for diversity and inclusion. I don't like to say solving because it's not a problem, but making sure that they're doing things that's within their wheelhouse. So we are working with more like a public-private partnership on this airband issue. But I also want to point out on it as well something that we learned from the maintainers listening tour. We were looking at, you know, we heard from maintainers that a lot of their, um, you know, international contributors couldn't participate synchronously via meetings when there's meetups or conferences or events. And so we were all thinking that it was an infrastructure issue. So in my mind, I was like, oh my gosh, how are we going to like dig power lines and set up Wi-Fi across, you know, all these different countries or whatever? When we started talking to folks from international countries, they were like, infrastructure isn't an issue. We have access to internet. It's just so expensive, the data, to even dial into a Zoom call. And so I said, well, how much would it cost for you to get unlimited data for the entire year? They were like, probably about 500 US dollars. So I was like, we've been stuck on, you know, not having infrastructure for these international contributors. And the only thing it took was 500 bucks. That's money. That's something yep. like a, that's like a swag t-shirt order for like mm -hmm. five people, right? Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's, I mean, as a human centered designer, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, uh, this is exactly why you don't just rely on data because otherwise you're just looking at the data and making assumptions right. that may or may not be correct. Um, and we have a question on that, that note about remote teams. Many of us work from home at least part time. Uh, and so what if somebody wants to have remote internships for, uh, and facilitate a more inclusive workforce, but they do have a remote team uh, and there could be issues with broadband or not having a, a laptop with up-to-date software, things like that. What can this person do to bridge that gap? Yeah, one, ask them, do they have a laptop? I was actually shocked with the number of students that did not have laptops as part of the All-In program. And so every student, they received academic credit for the program so that it was a part of their curriculum. We also paid them stipends for the entire program, fall and spring semester, and they're going to get paid with the corporate sponsor. We also provided all of them with a brand new MacBook because we did not want access to technology to be the issue. And for any of the students who have to work remotely during the summer, which all of them do, we asked them, did they need a hotspot? And so anybody that needed one, we're providing that for them. Those are just some of the small, and hotspots, you can go get those like, what, 100 bucks a month or something like that. So these are really, really small things. And guess what? Most people from underrepresented background, we're very prideful. So we may never let you know. We'll probably be driving to that McDonald's all night just, and we would never let you know that. So make sure you get in relationship with them and ask, is there anything that they need in order to, for you to make their experience better or for them to even participate in an opportunity? Never stop at a no. We are automatically, will say, hey, do, I, I had someone turn down an internship. I, and I was like, what? And I picked up the phone like, hey, what's going on? And she told me it was an infrastructure issue. And I was like, we can solve for that. But it never occurred to her to actually explain what the issue was. So whenever you hear no, see if you can actually go that step further. That's what it means to go all in. Like, just don't stop at that immediate answer. Yep. Uh, we have an audience question here um, from someone who is a black woman and said she does feel like the burden of this work is unfairly placed on you, on her, uh, because you know what has to be done uh, and you have devoted your career to talking about it. So how do you feel about shifting more of that effort onto the folks who 
have the most power and need to do the most work. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the, the one thing that I had to take a step back when I started this work and you, you know, start banging your head up against the wall is sometimes it, it, there's still a lot of education that has to be done, but it has to be more practical education. It's not, you know, very high level where we're talking about unconscious bias and privilege and all of the psychological safety. We've all read the books on those. Now people are saying, Demetrius, just tell me what you need for me to do. I'll give an example. Um, one of the students, and I shared this with his permission, his name is Bernard. He's from Zimbabwe. And he um, grew up in one of the villages of Zimbabwe. So no infrastructure, bathrooms, all of those, the basic necessities, farming. But he was really smart in school. And there was a school in South Africa that found him in his school. And they gave him a scholarship to attend this very privileged school in South Africa. When he got there, that he didn't have a laptop. Everybody else had a laptop, and the school was like, you get access to the computer lab for one hour every day. That's it. So Bernard was like, he didn't learn how to program or anything. He just had to do the very basics because that's all the time that he had. And so he applied to all of these scholarships, didn't get a scholarship to any of the colleges that he applied for, so he hitched a ride to Dubai where he laid bricks 13 hours a day for a couple of years. And he said every day when he got off work, he would just send out scholarship applications to anybody that would allow him to, you know, participate for free or that would allow him to apply for free. So a few years later, St. Augustine, which was one of our partner schools, offered him a full scholarship. He got over here to St. Aug, he made it, right? Well, they only had a computer information system program, which basically taught him more business classes and history classes. He never had a programming class. So Bernard said that I can only be, you know, a project manager, that's it comes all in. Uh, he's selected for all in. He goes through major league hacking. We looked at his data like they had to take a, a technical assessment. It was pretty much empty. He didn't know how to code. Bernard is now one of the strongest programmers in the entire program. He learned how to code within a course of about 10 weeks. And when he talked to me and talked about what all in meant, he said, now I can be a programmer. Nobody ever told me that before, ever, ever, ever. So I share that story to see if you can see all of the different places where people can help throughout that, that his career journey, from identifying him in that village to providing him with the laptop to helping him with the scholarship so that he's at a school to help him with the curriculum, more boot camp so that he, if his school didn't provide a curriculum. So many different places, but everybody's stuck on this back end of once Bernard graduates, how can I have that job for him? That's the easy work, providing a job and opening a rack now. Like, we have to look at all of those. And so shifting the burden means letting people know these stories and letting them know exactly how they can help. Because people, I think, naturally want to help. They just don't know how. This is just such a big topic. And everybody's trying to approach it and really not knowing where to start. And that's what we want to do for All In, give you very specific ways that you can help. And that's where the burden starts to shift. Well, we have a lot of enthusiastic partners in the room, I can tell, because we've had several questions about expanding all into high schools, and people are also interested in knowing if they have a school in mind for all in, where should they submit them for consideration? Go to allin.org. There's something called Join the Community, and it specifically tells you how you can join the community if you want to enter. It's a spot in there that says I'm an inter, um, individual contributor, and I want to introduce you to someone, and you can just explain it in that box. If you're a company, you can go right there and join the community as well. Like, we, we need more partners. I have more students that's interested in this program than partners at this time, even though I do have partners that have signed up. So, we want to grow this thing. Someone asked me, they were like, Demetrius, we need to get this to 10,000 students and it can't take 10 years. And I was like, okay, and we're going to do it. Like, I like big goals like that. I like to hear that. Yeah. So thank you. Well, we are almost done. So I will leave you with one uh, super simple question. When you think about the future of DEI and open source five years from now, what does that look like? DEI looks like open source. Um, there's just, if you think about where software development was 30 years ago before the advent of open source, it was everybody had their code, there was patent and copyright protections on it, everybody thought it was their competitive advantage and they didn't want to share, they didn't want to collaborate. And then open source come and we're all better for it. Diversity, equity and inclusion is being done in exactly the same way that software development was being done 30 plus years ago. 
we know how to do this. We know how to solve for this. There's no better industry, there's no better ecosystem that's primed to lead the way on this. And so that's why I'm so glad to be in this space. I found my people within open source because it is a daunting thing when you think you're doing it alone. But knowing that I have all of the thousands and millions of people in open source, we can do this. And we have all of the different principles of open source at our disposal. And I look forward to partnering with all of you. That's the future of open source and DEI that I see. I can't think of a better note to end on. So thank you so much, Demetrius. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, I will quickly say before you leave the room, uh, we will be hosting a BOF session on this topic this afternoon. Uh, it's going to be in the sea area, I believe. And so if you're still around and not flying out uh, right after this uh, and you'd want to talk more about All In, please join us because we would love to engage you here uh, and keep the conversation going. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren. Managing digital experience applications is quite the balancing act. Between providing the freedom and flexibility to create amazing experiences for your users and still maintaining control of your growing fleet of sites and applications. Achieve that perfect balance with Platform SH. Platform SH is a cloud-based end-to-end platform that enables you to efficiently build, host, scale, and secure sites and applications without worrying about infrastructure whether it's 10 sites or 10,000. Because when infrastructure and workflows are taken care of, teams are free to focus more on what really matters. Everything you need to power your sites is available from the start and then maintained, hosted, and secured by Platform SH. Databases and other services can be easily implemented into your sites with just a line of code, letting you launch faster. Instant cloning creates perfect production replicas in moments. Developers can work and test in parallel across an unlimited number of environments and then merge with production flawlessly and fearlessly. Plus, code can be written in whatever programming language works for your teams, making code more flexible and future-proof. And without traditional bottlenecks to deal with, every update can be deployed with complete confidence, anytime, anywhere, across your entire fleet. Yes, even on Fridays. Freedom and control balance together in one platform. Learn more and try for free at platform.sh. Hello, welcome, um, great session. Uh, so I'm here to present uh, the winners of the Exhibitor Passport Prizes. So I'm sure everybody's excited to see if they won. Uh, my name is Jessica Orozco. I'm the SVP of Global Sales for Platform SH. And as you may have seen in the video that just played, Platform SH is a unified, secure, enterprise-grade platform for building, running, and scaling your fleets of websites and web applications. Platform SH uh, is a uh, open uh, source-based platform, so that means that you can run anything from Drupal applications and other open source technologies as well. We are on a mission to enable forward-thinking organizations to build, iterate, and responsibly scale amazing digital experiences with zero time managing infrastructure. If you want to learn how you can manage your Drupal website fleet while reducing your carbon footprint, we encourage you to stop by the booth and get a demo or simply go to the website and get a free trial. Also, we're hiring, so if anybody is looking for a job, please come by and talk to us. Uh, let's grow together. Okay, so now the moment most of you have been waiting for to see if you won. Here are the winners of the Exhibitor Passport Prize.